Order. I remind honourable members that there have been some changes to normal practice in order to support the new hybrid arrangements. Timings of debates have been amended to allow technical arrangements to be made for the next debate. There will also be suspensions between each debate. I remind members participating physically and virtually, virtually that they must arrive for the start of the debates in Westminster Hall. Members are expected to remain for the entire debate. I must also remind members, particularly virtually, that they are visible at all times, both to each other and to us in the Bouveroid room. If members attending virtually have any technical problems, they should email the Westminster Hall clerk's email address. Members attending physically should clean their spaces before they use them and as they leave the room. I would also like to remind members that Mr Speaker has stated that masks must be worn in Westminster Hall. Members attending physically who are in the latter stages of the call list should use the seats in the public gallery and move into the horseshoe when seats become available. Members can only speak from the horseshoe where there are microphones. Catherine Fletcher to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Chairman. It's an honour to serve under your chairmanship, although I should demonstrate that not all talents are distributed equally, and I have managed to pour water all over my speech notes. So if there is any uh, disintegration of these words, I'm, I'm sure I'll beg your forgiveness. Um, I beg to move that this House has considered e-petition 300-139 relating to trespass. Today's petition debate is about how we access the countryside, how much we value it and what laws should govern its access. The petition proposes changes to legislation currently going through Parliament. In short, it asks we don't criminalise trespass. And before its closure in September last year, it had been signed by 134,932 people, 185 of which are from my own fabulous patch of South Ribble. Now, in seeking to fairly represent different sides of this complex debate, I've met with a number of individual and organisations, Mr Chairman, to hear their views, and I'm particularly grateful for their time and expert insights. My sincere thanks go to the, petitioners, the petition's originator, Guy Shrubsoll, Gemma Cantalo, representing the views of Ramblers, Abby Kirby, for sharing her thoughts from the travelling community, as well as George Dunn from the Tenant Farmers Association, Sam Durham for the NFU, the National Farmers, Asso no, National Farmers Union, and Andrew Gillett from the Country, Land and Business Association. Mr Chairman, with thanks over, let me take a step into the details of this debate. Uh, my right hon. Friend, the, policing, the Minister for Policing and Crime, stated that the government had made a clear manifesto commitment to act on the issue of unauthorised encampments and remains determined to ensure police have the powers that they need. As a result, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill 2021 introduces intentional trespass as a criminal offence. The Don't Criminalise Trespass petition was set up by Guy as he has a series of concerns about unintended consequences for countryside lovers and those who seek to reside in it. In his view, criminalising intentional trespass could lead to, not exclusively but just in a short form, prosecuting ramblers who stray from the path by accident. Well, I'm sure as the Minister and Mr Chairman, you know, something we've all done in this room, although I confess I'm normally in possession of a mountain bike as well as a rucksack when I'm issuing unfettered apologies for being in the wrong part of the countryside. Guy's also worried about preventing in participation in wild camping, even for personal safety or for enjoyment, and he's worried about limiting the rights of peaceful protests and, and, and forging new paths within the countryside. He's also keen to highlight the wider implications of criminalising intentional trespass on the lives of traveller communities across the country. Through an online survey, the Petitions Committee sought the opinions of affected groups and forums. A remarkable 84% of respondents felt that criminalisation of intentional trespass would have major or moderate effects on how they live their lives. Further conversations regarding access and a right of way with representatives of the Ramblers suggest similar concerns around the criminalisation of those who become lost and strayed from the footpath are also held in their eyes. 
They argue that the likelihood of becoming lost with unkempt footpaths, limited signage, lack of capability, in my own case, Mr Chairman, inhibits visitors from venturing out and exploring our beautiful countryside. Discouraging rambling should not be a consequence of this legislation, and nor should it be threatened. Respondents to the Petitions Committee survey also suggested that urban dwellers, which I was most definitely in my youth, include higher levels of minorities and the economically disadvantaged who already have less access to outdoor spaces in England. And they could be disproportionately affected either through reality or, or the perception that they're going to be criminalised for accessing the countryside. And the petitioners feel extremely strongly that this should not be the case. There were concerns that proposed changes in the law would add further barriers to outdoor access. I, for one, are proud we're a country with 140,000 miles of public rights of way, many fa mainly founded through public footpaths and bridle ways. These routes of access to the countryside, nature and wildlife are here to stay and are extremely important as an outlet for our educational, our mental, our physical needs. Like the petitioners, I use them regularly on my bike, on foot, and I would be deeply concerned if new legislation were to deter others enjoying the beauty of England, or, or, you, know, or, you know, north or south. Many robust concerns were raised about the unintended consequences of this legislation. And crucially, this opinion was mirrored across the conversations that I've had with Rambler groups, farmers, and landowners. During these discussions, it became clear that at the heart of the debate is a key phrase, to intentionally reside. In many cases, a lost walker has no intent to reside unlawfully on a farmer's field. When discussing this further, Guy's experience of wild camping in Dartmoor is a potential model. Stays there are restricted to a maximum of two nights. This prevents a camper from establishing intent to reside, and arguably they are at no risk of committing trespass by that account. The legislation which sparked the petition is aimed at tackling illegal encampments where visitors occupy land and do not leave when asked. And in representing the petitioners, I felt it appropriate to speak to those who the legislation seeks to support. Within my constituency of South Ribble, there have been a series of trespass issues for landowners. As trespass is currently a civil offence, returning access to landowners' property can be a lengthy process with temporary results. And the current reprimands of trespass do not equal the financial and environmental cost, as according to my local landowners, when they report back to me. Now, despite focus on unauthorised encampments, petitioners are concerned that under these proposed changes to the law, there's a very real possibility of manipulation of legislation to criminalise participants in wild camping, mountain biking, rambling, getting lost. And I look forward to hearing from the Minister what he can do to assuage those, those you know, extremely valid concerns. Um, representatives of the National Farmers Union, of the Country Land and Business Association and the Tenant Farmers Association were keen, Mr Chairman, to highlight that farmers and landowners are delighted to share the countryside with others as long as visitors are respectful. This relates largely to steering clear of livestock and crop production and adhering to the countryside code. They were keen, however, to speak to the points in the petition. In their view, instances of trespass with residency have become a larger problem with the use of intimidation, violence and environmental destruction being reported to them. They felt current legislation was not a useful tool to prevent these issues in order to best prevent and discourage intentional and destructive trespass. It seems logical to them to make this a criminal offence. I discussed these points with Abby from friends, family and travellers. It was a really brilliant conversation. She expressed the importance of not associating certain behaviours with all members of the travelling community. And with authorised traveller sites in South Ribble, I must wholeheartedly agree with her. She did, however, recognise a persistent problem with unlawful encampments, but has huge concerns that further legislation compounds the inequalities experienced by the traveller community. In just one example, the bill strengthens police powers and includes the ability to seize a vehicle. For those within the traveller community, this could be the seizure of their home and possessions. 
with a limited number of lawful sites where they, in which they can reside, Abbey and the petitioners, petitioners argue strongly for improved site provision being the key to preventing issues, not further legislation. She says on behalf of the travelling community, quite clearly, don't criminalise trespass. So, since the inception of the petition and our meetings, the delay due to COVID means that the subject of this position, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, received its second reading on the House, in the House of Commons on the 15th and 16th of March. Well, the bill contains provisions related to unauthorised encampments, including the creation of an offence relating to residing on land without consent in or with a vehicle. And I, my understanding is that this phrasing of the offence is to in part address the concerns raised by the petitioners. I look forward to hearing from the Minister later. This new offence has been framed in such a way, is my understanding, to ensure that the rights of ramblers and others to enjoy the countryside are not impacted. Despite this, under the definition provided, a bicycle could constitute a vehicle and, and would therefore still potentially look me and my haphazard mountain biking um, at risk. Um, the inclusion of a bicycle within the definition highlights the, re the, the concerns for many of those who have signed this position. Um, and, you know, I'd look forward to hearing what the Minister's response later. So, to, to conclude, Mr Chairman, petitioners are worried about the introduction of a barrier on their access to the wonderful British countryside or the idea that this would put others off from accessing our bridleways and footpaths for recreation and, and mental health, enjoyment, nature and game and all those amazing things that happened. Farmers and landowners are experiencing difficulty with unlawful encampments, which they believe the current statute cannot assist with, but are, are mindful of unintended consequences in legislation. And the traveller community has concerns about their way of life and being judged by the actions of a minority, which is also shared by the petitioners. So I repeat my grateful thanks for all of those who signed the petition and for those who took the time to meet with me in the run-up to today's debate. I look forward to the responses to this difficult and nuanced area from colleagues. As the petition says, don't criminalise trespass, but is this residing on land without consent with a vehicle? Mr Chairman. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 300139 relating to trespass. Andy Salter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Bone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in front of you uh, in Westminster Hall today. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the Petitions Committee for uh, facilitating this debate. Slightly later than we envisaged, I think it was January, it was due to take place. Um, but if anything, it's more relevant now, as, as, as uh, the mover has, has said. Uh, we've now had the second reading of the Police Crime Sentencing and, and Courts Bill. And I think from looking at the arguments put forward there, and I have to say, I compliment the mover in in putting forward a balanced argument today, but I think actually, in an effort to do that, what shone through is how strong the arguments are on one side, that against this provision, this wholly unnecessary provision which is being included in the, uh, in, in the police bill for reasons I will speculate on uh, in, in a moment, um, uh, there is no reason for this. And I'm sure that had we, if, we, if the petition had not been closed as they are after six months, we would have had many more than 135,000 uh, signatures now. Because there are lots of groups threatened by the criminalisation of, of trespass. Ramblers, we mentioned, off-road cyclists, canoeists, wild campers, those forced to live in a vehicle by homelessness or other circumstances, those who care about and want access to the countryside. Now, the government has responded to these concerns by implying in its response to the consultation and the bill that many of these groups are not the target. Well, two things spring from this. Firstly, they have not persuaded anyone. This is what the Ramblers Association say in their briefing for this debate. The, the legislation is vaguely drafted and many of its proposals are unclear in both scope and reach. This risks criminalising activities such as wild camping when accessed by motor vehicle or bicycle and the legitimate right to protest. 
The bill would allow the police to take action on suspicion by an officer that they might intend to reside. It would give the minority of landowners who might wish to make the countryside a hostile place for those seeking to enjoy it for recreation a powerful new tool to deter users. The potential for abuse of this legislation is obvious and significant. The bill will send a, si a signal that the countryside is not an open resource accessible to all, but a place of complex rules and regulations with criminal sanctions for briefing them. But secondly, if the government did succeed by further amendment at committee stage or later to so limit the bill, it would become clearer who is primarily the target, gypsy and traveller communities and those who adopt a nomadic lifestyle through choice or necessity. In short, Mr Bowen, I say this regretfully, but I can only reach the conclusion that this is a, a, a rather nasty, racist little attempt to attack minority ethnic communities already suffering severe discrimination and other socially marginalised groups. Let me repeat something which I said when speaking on the bill at second reading. No family willingly stops somewhere they are not welcome, that has no running water, waste disposal or electricity, and where they will be harassed. The reason for unauthorised encampments is the lack of authorised sites, whether they be permanent or transit sites. And the number of permanent transit sites on aggregate have gone down over the past 10 years by uh, several hundred and by over 8% over in total. The gypsies and travellers are the most marginalised and discriminated, uh, uh, one of the most marginalised and discriminated against groups in, uh, in this country. Their outcomes, whether in health, uh, education, life expectancy are, are the worst of any uh, ethnic minority groups and proper provision is simply not made. There are 354 transit pitches across the whole of England, only 29 local authority provides them. If there is nowhere to go then uh, 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 of an authorised nature, then what alternative is there but to use unauthorised sites there are 1,696 households on the waiting list for pitches with only 59 vacant pitches on permanent sites and 42 on transit sites. Um, the, in responding to the petition, the government said this. The law of trespass is largely one of common law, with the courts developing the law and resolving disputes based on circumstances of the case. Uh, however, following the uh, 2018 consultation, it was clear, clearly wasn't clear, Mr Bone, because most people uh, opposed the provisions when responding to that, to that consultation. It is clear, say the government, that action is needed to address the sense of unease and intimidation residents feel when an, when an unauthorised encampment occurs. Now that's an insidious piece of text. Firstly, it's, it, it is good that control of trespass has been brought, uh, built up by the common law over the centuries. Secondly, there's plenty of legislation on this matter, notably the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994. That legislation was seen as draconian at the time. This goes much further. Over the past two decades, law enforcement and nomadic communities have tried to make the current law work by guidance, by negotiation and by compromise. The police bill strips away all of that experience and sets up confrontation, arbitrary use of power and the threat of arrest, imprisonment, loss of home and perhaps of families. And for what purpose? So the Home Secretary can indulge in a bit of dog whistle politics. If you think I'm exaggerating, earlier today I, cha I chaired a seminar organised by the All Party Parliamentary Group for gypsies, travellers and Roma to hear the real life experience of gypsies and travellers and from their advocates in the Friends, uh, Families and Travellers movement uh, and the Traveller movement, uh, lawyers supporting those, those communities, all of which do an excellent job. We have stories of traveller families who had booked official camping sites only to be, or caravanning sites, only to be turned away on arrival. The racism of pontings in refusing access on grounds of ethnicity is far from rare. Without access to legal sites, where our family is supposed to go? Under the current law, there is at least a chance of negotiating an organised departure, and the discretion lies with the police, 
whose guidance says that only where there is damage, abusive behaviour or multiple vehicles should precipitous action be taken. Under the new law, we apparently need to address the sense of unease local residents may feel, an intention to reside or the likelihood to cause damage, disruption or distress. Has there ever been a law so disingenuously or vaguely worded, and it is clear why, because in their frequently answered questions as, a, as an explanation given by the government, they say the, uh, the, that uh, strength and police powers and the new offences could also deter unauthorised encampments from being set up in the first instance. What this is designed to do is to frighten uh, people into taking no action at all is to attack the principles of nomadic life which the government has already attacked by uh, changing the definition of what gypsies and travellers means. If this legislation gets passed and amended it's going to have a rough ride in the courts. It's already clear that it violates important principles of the Human Rights Act and the Equalities Act. No one with any sense supports this unnecessary and vindictive provision. Certainly not the police. Only 21% responded positively to the proposals of, of, of police organisations uh, to, uh, to, to the proposal in the consultation, while 94% called for more site provision. I know there are a number of other people waiting to speak, but I think I've taken my allotted, uh, allotted chance. I will simply say to the Minister, uh, because this is the time to make considerations about what change is going to be made in detail of the bill, that part four adds nothing useful to the current law. It will do huge damage to the relationships between settled communities, uh, gypsies and travellers. Uh, it will put the police in an extremely difficult position and it will suck in whole other groups of people who, whether he intends this or not, uh, are also severely worried about the consequences. Let's have a sensible and mature rethink of this and let's drop these invidious proposals now. Move to David Simmons. Mr. Bone, a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. As we consider this very important matter of illegal encampments and unauthorised access to land, may I commend the Honourable Member for South Ribble for her very eloquent and importantly balanced uh, introduction to this debate. It's important for me to be clear from the outset that I and my constituents strongly support the introduction of tougher measures to protect land and property, whether it belongs to private individuals or the taxpayer in the form of central government or the local authority, from trespass. I would also like to pay tribute to the work of Councillor John Warmersham, the Labour leader of the UK delegation at the Congress of the Council of Europe, who has led work for many years at an international level to improve the way in which human rights law, as administered by local authorities and regional government, treats uh, gypsy, Roma and traveller people. And his work has been very important in informing my thinking on this subject and my approach to this petition today. And it seems to me, Mr Chairman, that there is no evidence that the proposed strength and measures would deter anyone from lawful access to private land. Ramblers and walkers, and riders do not see their legitimate and time-honoured access restricted by what the government is proposing. It is very clear, as the Honourable Member for South Ribble said, that powers to prosecute are triggered only in circumstances where someone is present where they have no right to be, and when they refuse to leave when asked. And in my constituency on the edge of London, we have many popular walking and rambling paths, many mountain bike routes, many bridleways and users of these amenities, many of which are maintained by private landowners as part of the good husbandry of their holdings, should have no fear that they will be negatively impacted. It's also clear that the law in Scotland may offer a model to consider. I know it's something which the government has been consulting on, where tris trespass is a criminal offence, but legitimate use of the property uh, is, is included. I, I can see other members may disagree with that, but that is the, the legal interpretation that I've seen in the briefing. I, I look forward to being enlightened. But many communities have suffered significant blight from unauthorised encampments for too long. Uh, speaking personally, I live opposite a green space which is owned and maintained by the London Borough of Hillingdon. 
which was the subject of one such incursion. And like many people across the country, I and other residents were treated to the sight of people defecating publicly opposite our homes, seeing rubbish strewn around, extensive vandalism, and normal activities, children's football, outdoor exercise, dog walking, all had to stop whilst the legal process was followed. And once that notice was served, I watched alongside those other residents as campers gathered all the glass that they'd accumulated during their stay, smashing it to fragments and scattering it across the whole area so as to maximize the harm and inconvenience that their illegal incursion caused to the community. And when they finally left, they left behind a massive cleanup job. And for that season, a bill in excess of £300,000 for council taxpayers to meet. So I speak from personal experience when I say that these measures are long overdue. Now, Mr Chairman, there will be those who argue that legitimate lifestyles are at risk of being criminalised. I wholly disagree. Not one moment of what I witnessed personally was legitimate, and both the settled and the temporary residents of the local caravan sites, which are made available for public use, would agree, because they pay council tax to clear up this kind of mess as well. Breaking into other people's property, causing them misery and stress, and often massive cost, is simply unacceptable. It is not a lifestyle, it is straightforward criminality, and it must be robustly dealt with when it occurs. Now clearly, Mr Chairman, there is here a balance to be struck. At the moment, in my view, the balance weighs too heavily against the landowner and the taxpayer, and in favour of those small minority of criminals who choose to exploit the fact. It is absolutely right, in my view, that the government takes heed of the concerns of communities across London and across the whole of the rest of the country and enacts these measures. Thank you. Margaret Greenwood. Thank you, Mr. Bone, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this important debate, and I'd like to begin by paying tribute to the more than 134,000 people, including 149 of my own constituents in Wirra West, who signed the petition, Don't Criminalise Trespass, which we are now debating. The petition set, set out how the government's manifesto stated that the Conservative Party will make intentional trespass a criminal offence. It pointed out that this is, quote, an extreme, illiberal and unnecessary attack on ancient freedoms that would threaten walkers, campers and the wider public. And it expressed concern that this could, amongst other things, criminalise ramblers who stray even slightly from the path, criminalise wild camping, denying hikers and items of the stars. The petition shows the great strength of feeling on this issue and is part of the great tradition that we have in this country of securing access to the countryside through protest. We have an incredibly important tradition of accessing the great outdoors and we're richly blessed in terms of the diversity of landscapes that, landscapes that we can enjoy. That tradition is in activities such as walking, cycling, kayaking and mountaineering. It's in the activities of the brownies, girl guides, the cubs and the scouts. And it's there too in our culture through the poetry of Wordsworth and the paintings of Turner to name just two of the many artists and writers who have found inspiration in the power and grandeur of the natural world. We have wonderful national parks such as Snowdonia, the Lake District, the Peak District. The latter became the first national park in the UK almost exactly 70 years ago on the 17th of April 1951. And our national parks give us access to breathtaking coastal scenery too, such as that in Pembrokeshire, the South Downs and the North York Moors. In my constituency of Wirral West, there is Caldy Hill, Thurston Common, Irby Hill and Harrop Wood, all owned and cared for by the National Trust which does such an important job preserving such areas for the benefit of local people and visitors. So when we reflect on all that we have to enjoy, it is important to consider the invaluable work of individual conservationists, campaigners and protest groups that have delivered such riches to us and have ensured that we can access these beautiful places. People like Beatrix Potter, who bought large tracts of land in Cumbria specifically to preserve the landscape and who left 4,000 acres of countryside to the National Trust as well as 14 farms when she died in 1943, countryside which millions of people enjoy today in what we know as the Lake District National Park. And people like the hundreds of ramblers from Manchester and elsewhere who took part in the mass trespass on Kinder Scout in 1932. Knowing our history is important and the mass trespass is widely credited with 
leading to legislation in 1949 to establish the national parks by the Labour Ackley government, playing a part in the development of the Pennine Way and, and many other long distance footpaths, secure, and securing walkers' rights over open country and common land in the Countryside Rights of Way Act 2000. In 2007, Lord Roy Hattersley described it as, quote, the most successful di direct action in British history. In January of this year, a number of organisations, including the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England, Friends of the Earth and the Ramblers, wrote to the Home Secretary, arguing that making trespass a criminal offence is an extreme, illiberal and unnecessary attack on ancient freedoms. They warned that it would send a signal that the countryside is not an open resource accessible to all, but a place of complex rules and regulations where stepping off a public path could lead to a criminal sentence. Recently, the government published its Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, and we subsequently had the second reading of the bill, which Labour opposed. The proposals in the sections of the bill on unauthorised encampments create a new offence of residing on land without consent in or with a vehicle. However, more than 250 civil society groups are still concerned that the bill threatens our right of access to the countryside, something that they made clear in their letters to the Home Secretary and the Secretary of State for Justice last month. Liberty has pointed out that the provisions of the bill will impact access to the countryside and affect the enjoyment of British land for recreational activities. So can the Minister tell us, how is the bill consistent with the government's commitment to open up the natural world as it's stated in its 25-year environmental plan? The countryside should always be accessible to everyone, and it's incredibly important that we follow on in the tradition of those who have gone before us to secure rights of access. The petition, which is the subject of today's debate, also raised important concerns that legislation making intentional trespass criminal offence could impact on gypsy, roma and traveller communities. And I have to say, I was very shocked by the comments of the previous speaker. The bill includes a new criminal offence of trespass with the intent to reside. Up to now, trespass has been a civil offence. The National Chief Police Council and the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners have stated quite clearly that trespass is a civil offence and our view is that it should remain so, and that no new criminal trespass offence is required. So why has the government ignored this viewpoint? The charity Friends, Families and Travellers have warned that making trespass a criminal offence would push gypsy and travellers into the criminal justice system, merely for existing nomadically. They have pointed to an absence of places where gypsies and travellers are permitted to stop or reside. One of my constituents wrote to me to say that she is from one of the many gypsy traveller and nomadic communities who will be directly and harmfully affected by the criminalisation of tra trespass put forward in the bill. She said, and I quote, we need more sites and stopping places where gypsies and travellers are allowed to be. Nobody should be made a criminal or punished for living a nomadic way of life. So what is the minister's response to my constituent? What would he say to her about how this government is treating gypsy traveller and nomadic communities? The petition also raises concerns <clears throat> about the government's proposals to, quote, clamp down on peaceful protests, a fundamental right and essential part of our democracy. Numerous organisations have drawn attention to how the bill threatens the right to peaceful protest. Three years ago this month, many of us gathered in Parliament Square to see the unveiling of the first statue of a woman in, a woman in Parliament Square, the suffragist Millicent Fawcett. She's holding a banner which reads, Courage calls to courage everywhere. It was an historic moment for us democratically. Protests and demonstrations have forged positive change in our country over generations, whether that be the act actions of the suffragettes, tackling the grotesque injustice of women not even having the right to vote, or more recently, the actions of anti-fracking protesters who set up camp in places like Preston New Road in Lancashire. The actions of those campaigners helped achieve a moratorium on fracking, and now the government says fracking is over in the UK. The numerous demonstrations for employment rights that have been spearheaded by the trade union movements have been crucial in furthering the rights of working people. And the protests of people up and down the country <clears throat> against the Conservative government's plans to privatise the National Health Service continue, showing the passion with which people believe in a National Health Service paid for through direct taxation, free to all at the point of need. Without people being able to gather and show their opposition to issues of social injustice and tax on the environment, the government would feel as though it could do whatever it pleased. No government should ever be given that opportunity. It is as important now as it has ever been 
to make clear that we demand the right to protest. Any attempt to curtail that right strikes at the heart of our democracy. Thank you. Um, Catherine West. Thank you, Mr. Boner. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and contribute to this important debate. It's a pleasure also to uh, highlight the 600 signatures from Hornsey and Wood Green, because clearly my constituents are very concerned about um, their ability to go about uh, and enjoy the great uh, outdoors. We are blessed with parks and walks in Hornsey and Wood Green, but none, none so lovely as being outside of London and enjoying uh, a quiet walk. During the pandemic, we know that this desire to be outdoors has been heightened because of the uh, impact that the loneliness uh, of coronavirus has had on, on our mental health. And so it's been lovely for our friends and families to walk and explore in the countryside. I do hope that the government will have a rethink on this. And I know that there is a number of uh, campaigns and newspaper articles calling, uh, including from the Ramblers, a very well-established group, um, calling for the government to have a rethink so that we can really fully enjoy, particularly uh, in the summer months as we go towards possibly having uh, another year of holidays at home, um, so that we can really enjoy that without the fear of being told that we are trespassing. Um, the proposals risk putting a stop, of course, to some of the walks which we enjoy so much and closing off vast swathes of the countryside to remote and closed off landowners. And I also believe it does provide a disincentive to some local authorities who don't look after the paths and do not maintain the tracks and do not show uh, the signage which uh, can make the enjoyment of a walk slightly spoiled when you get lost um, and can actually lead to trespass if um, local authorities are not looking after paths well. So I do hope that the minister, who of course has got a background in local government, will take note perhaps to send a little note round to all the local leaders asking them to look after the paths so that there's not a risk of trespass but that people can walk with proper signage and enjoy um, their ramble. Um, I also of course wanted to uh, uh, emphasise the desire for some naturalists in carrying out their wildlife surveys um, and some scientists have warned that these, this legislation could prevent some of that basic science which is how we get to have our love of science and nature. Um, and it can't be stressed enough just how vital it is for us all to have gain access to nature in the open countryside. Um, we know that the sales of camping equipment have soared, great for the economy. British canoeing has seen a 40% jump in membership and our national parks have seen huge numbers of visitors. I'm not sure yet whether the government's got round to implementing Labour's suggestion from the last manifesto to put in some more national parks. But certainly the idea of visiting a national park while one goes about a camp, camp um, experience um, shouldn't be underestimated. Um, I want briefly also to um, highlight my concerns um, relating to uh, some of the debate around this bill. At second reading, it was really disheartening to see member after member stand up and criticise in very um, demeaning terms uh, the um, gypsy and traveller community um, going around their um, travelling and some of the challenges which that community particularly faces. We know that the statistics show us that the gypsy and traveller community is probably the most discriminated community against in Europe um, and it is really dispiriting in this wonderful parliament to hear member after member getting up in the second reading of the debate and having a go at um, the gypsy and traveller community. That's not what the House of Commons should be about. The police have been clear that they believe that the powers that they have are sufficient. 75% of police responses um, in, to the proposals show that they believe that their current powers were sufficient. Additionally, 84% did not support the criminalisation of unauthorised encampments and 65% said lack of site provision was the real problem. In my view, some of the problem with policing is the 50% closures of all police stations since 2010 and the drop in numbers of police. Hundreds of police have been taken off the streets since 2010, and that's the real problem with uh, much of our policing. And in particular, some of our schools say that they miss having the friendly um, Bobby on the beat who drops into the schools, because a lot of that um, policing in schools has disappeared from the budget, and I think that's a real pity. And I think that's the sort of issue that we want to get down to, not this high level um, mudslinging at minority communities. 
So I do urge the government to pull back from this dangerous, illiberal and unnecessary step. If they really want to protect landowners, ministers should heed the calls by the police and campaigners, provide access, well-maintained walking paths, sites for travellers, rather than continuing down this thinly veiled attack on rights of, li of livelihoods, which will deny so many the chance to explore our beautiful countryside. Thank you, Mr Bone. Thank you. Um, Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Mr Bone, and I'm glad to speak in this debate with you in the chair. This debate is important and timely as we await the committee stage of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. The proposals around the criminalisation of trespass are deeply concerning, and I want to focus today on an area of those. There is real concern that these proposals will have the effect of deterring people from accessing the countryside for recreation. We've seen during the pandemic that access to green space and the countryside is central to promoting people's physical and mental well-being. But access to green space has too often been the preserve of a small number of more privileged groups. Over the last year, we've begun to see a broadening of access as more people seek out green spaces and visit the countryside. And it's vital that this is promoted rather than suppressed. I am concerned that the provisions in the bill could deter people who seek to access green spaces for entirely legitimate reasons. Key to this is the provision which allows people to be stopped by the police if they're suspected of intending to reside on land without consent. This power is so broadly defined that it could cover people on wild cycling trips who intend to camp on open land such as moors or hillsides. It would give the small number of landowners determined to discourage public access to the countryside a powerful tool to make that a hostile place. The potential for abuse of this legislation is obvious. The impact of this measure on trespass would be to create an image of the countryside as a place which is governed by complex rules and regulations with criminal sanctions for breaching them. This will particularly deter people who already have more negative experiences of the criminal justice system, especially people from diverse communities who already face more structural barriers in accessing the countryside. And the end effect of these proposals is likely to be fewer people accessing the countryside. Now, the government has claimed that it wants to do more to promote access to nature for everyone. But their actions say otherwise. From a delayed environment bill, which makes no firm commitments on access to nature, through to this retrograde proposal, which could actively deter people from getting out into the countryside, we are seeing a government which is putting up barriers rather than breaking them down. If the government chooses to criminalise trespass, it would also be completely out of touch with the public mood. More people visiting the countryside and green spaces due to COVID-19. Visits to parks and green spaces have doubled in the last 10 years, and more people are taking part in outdoor activities. Despite this, the number of people who spend little or no time in natural spaces is still too high. Evidence shows that access to good quality green space, such as parks, woodlands, fields, or allotments, varies greatly depending on where they live. The most economically deprived areas often have less available public green space, meaning people in those communities have fewer opportunities to reap the benefits to their health and well-being. I join the Ramblers and other groups urging the government to reconsider and drop these damaging proposals so that people are free to enjoy the countryside without the threat of criminalisation hanging over them. Thank you. Mary Kelly Foy. Thank you, Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon. It's with great sadness that I speak to the House on this subject again, because it seems that when it comes to Gypsy, Roma and traveller communities, the government never, ever learns. The Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill contains many authoritarian measures, but none so pernicious as those aimed at GRT communities. I was saddened too to come across the most awful racism on Twitter this week in relation to the Channel 5 programme, Here Comes the Gypsies. It was sickening to read the way people were displaying their prejudices, many without any challenge. But of course, there's a political context to this, to this hatred. The Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, as we know, includes measures to strengthen police powers to tackle unauthorised encampments where trespassers cause distress and misery to local communities and businesses. And of course, as members have mentioned, the criminalisation of trespass is a direct attack on 
nomadic lifestyle of many gypsies and travellers. Police forces around the country have specifically asked not to be given these powers of trespass as they realise that they attack the lifestyles of groups who are often voiceless and don't have a choice over where to stop. When the measures to criminalise trespass were consulted on by the government, over 90% of police bodies said that the provision of additional legal sites for encampments rather than additional criminal powers should be the approach taken by government. So why are we seeing this unthinking and vicious anti-traveller legislation once again? Well, it starts from a lack of education that politicians and legisla legislators don't understand and worse still, don't try to understand the problems faced by Gypsy, Roma and traveller communities, trying to balance their, their nomadic traditions with the need for services and the constant hostility wherever they settle. And at the heart of this is a form of racism. I know it's been said before, but there's a reason why anti-Gypsy Roman traveller prejudice is called the last acceptable face of racism. Because politicians don't stop and think before they paint whole communities as the problem. Perfectly demonstrated by the member for Ruslip Northwood and Pinner a few moments ago. Communities all over the country have issues with rubbish, anti-social behaviour and small time criminality. Nobody should excuse such behaviour or pretend that it doesn't exist. But we have a racism problem when one section of our society is blamed and targeted relentlessly and others are excused or ignored. The double standards of that targeting should be scrutinised by this house, not fueled. Because we should be honest about what this is. It's a political attack on gypsy, Roma and traveller communities. It's kicking a community that has very little self-defence mechanism at their disposal. And this is the key thing. There are other solutions. As Abby uh, Kirby of Friends, Families and Travellers has said, the government shouldn't imprison people, fine them and remove their homes for the crime of having nowhere to go. Another way is possible through negotiated stopping and by identifying land where traveller sites can be built, councils can ensure nomadic families have a safe place to stop, save money on evictions and improve relations between travelling and settled communities. Giving people dignity and respect, all people, is a fundamental duty for anyone who calls themselves an anti-racist or anyone who even understands the concept of human rights. And it's so easy to scapegoat a community, sometimes unconsciously, but it's just as damaging, all because we don't take the time to listen, understand and find solutions. Tony Benn once said, the way a government treats refugees is very instructive because it shows you how they would treat the rest of us if they could get away with it. And I think the same could be said for the way our government treats the travelling community. And that's our challenge. If we want to live in a decent, respectful and fair society, we should think about what that means in practice and look for the answers that are already out there in the provision of adequate sites, services and facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Chair. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship um, this afternoon. I'm speaking not only as someone who supports the right to roam freely, but as a Sheffield MP standing in a long and proud tradition of Sheffielders who fought for that right to roam. Many constituents have contact contacted me about this issue with uh, 713 signing this petition and many others emailing me about the debate today. Our debate on this petition is actually well timed although delayed it takes place at the epicenter of two dates that are important to my city and to my constituency and that they have significance for the whole country the first date fell on saturday the 17th of april which marked the 70th anniversary of the peak district national park 
the peaks were the first UK uh, national park. The foundations of the park were actually built by my historic constituent, and her name was Ethel Haythorn Thwaite, and she was born in um, 1894. After falling in love with the beauty of the countryside surrounding our city, she founded Sheffield Association for the Protection of Local Countryside, the association that would later become the Peak District and South Yorkshire branch of Campaigns Protect Rural England. Throughout her life, she directed a host of campaigns to defend the green spaces in and around Sheffield for use by everyone. The second important date is this Saturday the 24th, which will be the 89th anniversary of the Skinder, Cat, Sc Kinder Scout mass trespass mentioned by my honourable friend, the member for Wirral West. Kinder Scout was one of the many regular trespasses into Moreland estates organised by workers from northern industrial towns and cities, such as the Sheffield Clarion Ramblers. Prior to the founding of the national parks, these workers were fo forced to trespass because Moreland estates were privately owned by the landed gentry. Their demands were simple, that everyone should be able to access the moors. In 1945, their efforts were recognised when they elected a government that shared that view, not only of Ethel, but of the kinder, kinder trespassers as well. Ethel was actually appointed to the National Parks Committee and helped the new government deliver the 1949 National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act. Now ministers are proposing to turn back the clock and make trespass a criminal offence. Not only are they attacking the right to roam, but they are also attacking the community of people, the gypsy, roma and traveller community, to live as they wish. If the government were serious about addressing the issue of unauthorised encampments, they would increase funding to have more, more legal sites and more places to legally stop, not pass new laws that attack an already persecuted community and force more people into a criminal justice system. We should look to extend our right to uh, green spaces, not deter people from accessing our precious countryside. And neither should we criminalise those whose culture is based around the right to roam. As a Sheffield MP, I'm proud to stand on the shoulders of Ethel Haythorne Thwaite, the, the Sheffield Parry and Ramblers, and the Kinder Scout trespasses, in demanding that everyone should enjoy, as Ethel put it, the peace freedom, solitude and excitement that comes with the escape into the clean air and the gradual return to nature. Uh, thank you. Martin Doherty Hughes. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Bonin. It's uh, good to see you in the chair and I hope that you and the clerks are well in these difficult times. Uh, can I also thank those who have uh, brought forward the petition and I'm grateful for those members who opened the debate to which I'll now sum up on behalf of the Scottish National Party. There will be, of course, those who will ask that why are we participating in this debate, given that the, the idea of trespass is uh, fully remitted to uh, the UK Parliament for England uh, and also for Wales. But it is because it relates also to the police bill, which will have ramifications for Scots law. Can I first of all, though, <clears throat> if you'll forgive me, uh, Mr. Bowen, clarify some points on terms of the law in Scotland. At uh, this moment in time, trespass in both England and Scotland uh, is a civil wrong, but it's not a criminal act. And I can at least speak on behalf, behalf, behalf of my own party, if re-elected to government uh, in May, we'll certainly not be bringing any legislation forward at Holyrood to follow the police act, that we, which seeks to uh, criminalise, at least from our perspective, trespass. I also maybe want to uh, highlight some uh, points I heard also during the debate around the idea, uh, I have to say, it seemed as though we were saying that um, all gypsy and travel members of the gypsy travel community, merely by being members of those ancient historic communities, create criminal acts. Now, I have to say, uh, as someone who saw my own windows smashed at the weekend, uh, I can tell you it certainly wasn't by members of the gypsy and traveller community. It was clearly somebody who probably had too much wine at the weekend in the sun uh, after during a global pandemic. Uh, I wasn't going to assume for one minute, Mr Bones, that as a member of the Gypsy or Traveller or the Roma community, extraordinary statement. Uh, these are entrenched, I have to say, Mr Bone, in a lot of the narrative and debate and discussions we've had over the last couple of months as we lead up uh, to the police bill and its debates in Parliament. Uh, and it's been quite horrific to hear some of the dreadful instances of racism and bigotry that our Gypsy and Traveller and Roma communities face. Uh, and it's not to say that it's in any way perfect uh, in, in Scotland at all in, on terms of reflection, but there has been an opportunity to learn and to move forward 
And that's for all parties, I have to say, uh, not only in the Scottish Parliament, but also my colleagues in local government through the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, who only before the breakup of the, per the last session of the Holyrood Parliament uh, co-signed uh, uh, Scotland's uh, national plan for the Gypsy and Traveller community, signed by my colleagues, uh, the Qualities Minister, Christina McKelvey, uh, and Councillor Kelly Pally of COSLA, but it seeks to secure political support across all parties to work together to improve the lives of Scotland's gypsies and travellers, to formally recognise the right to travel and committed to finding ways to map and, where possible, reopen traditional, and as I often say, ancient stopping places across the nation of Scotland used since at least the 12th century. And of course, the Scottish Government and also COSLA, uh, representing all parties, announced a shared commitment with Police Scotland to work together uh, to challenge discrimination and promote equality for gypsy and travellers, people who have been economically, socially and politically excluded from our countries. And that's also been brought forward with a package of investment uh, up to £20 million uh, announced through that action plan. And critically, in terms of the issue of housing, linking it to Scotland's national housing strategy to make sure that gypsy and traveller communities were living on uh, official or new sites uh, or on their nomadic lifestyles have access to that investment. And, and, I, and I think in terms of the debate, we have even recently seen Mr Bowen here in Scotland, some rather unfortunate terminology from the government's, UK government's party in the way in some of which their own members have utilised this debate to marginalise yet again the gypsy and traveller community in Scotland. And I'm glad that no one else here is participating in that type of language. I just wonder maybe if the minister will consider that it's maybe opportune to reflect on what happens in Scotland the right to roam legislation, uh, working with the gypsy traveller community, and as the members who are across England have already mentioned, the requirement to invest in not only existing sites, but to open up England's ancient and historic uh, traveller sites, which is part of much of, the, of England's heritage uh, as, in, as any other element. And it's very important, I think, that that should be done. Uh, and I wonder if the minister would also recognise the recognition to not criminalise trespass because of the existing legislation which police forces across not only England but Wales and Scotland say there is no need for this new legislation. And also the requirement uh, to understand infrastructure. I also happen, just before I conclude, uh, Mr Bone, happen to be the Member of Parliament for Western Berkshire, in which you find the National Park headquarters for Loch Lomond and the Trossachs. And I'm afraid you'll have to say that the vast majority of uh, trespass and also vandalism, the lighting of fires, has never traditionally been by the traveller or the gypsy community. It's for those of us who've went out and utilised that lovely part of the world. And through the right to roam, working with people, working with communities, the National Park as a body has reduced those elements of uh, of fires, of litter, uh, of antisocial behaviour by making sure that we work together. I hope the government, I hope the minister will reflect on the lived experiences and also the policy experiences across these islands uh, and I look forward to hearing their answers. Thank you Mr Bone. Thank you. We now go to the Shadow Minister Sarah Jones. <clears throat> We have a, a problem with the sound at the moment, Shadow Minister, so if you bear with us, we'll oh, try. Forgive me, forgive me, it's my fault. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry, so sorry. I was saying it was a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, uh, Mr Bone. I wanted to just start by thanking everyone who signed the petition and all the individuals and organisations who have spent a lot of time in the various consultations and processes around this issue, giving their views. It is clear that there is a, a, a very strong uh, community of organisations from all kinds of different um, backgrounds and interests who are coming together um, to, 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 to give their view and to oppose what the government is seeking to do. And I want to thank them. Can I thank the uh, member for South Ribble, who I think gave a very um, balanced um, view as the as the member for, for Hammersmith said and and the member for Hammersmith who who is so principled and so practical in everything that he says and I do hope that the minister um, 
was paying close attention. Um, and thank you to, to, to all colleagues who've spoken in the debate. I think both the importance of keeping our countryside open um, a, a, as much as possible for as many people as possible, and also the, 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 the um, other side of this issue, which is the prejudice and harm uh, that this legislation uh, will do um, to the gypsy traveller uh, Roma communities that was very you know, very well articulated by by several members, including the member for for Durham, who I think made a really powerful case. So I, I want to thank everyone for the, for their contribution. Um, uh, as we've heard, um, over you know, 140,000 people signed the petition against the government's proposals, and that is not surprising when you look at the moral, the practical problems. Uh, that the government uh, is introducing with these proposals. The Petitions Committee online survey was really interesting, asking petitioners for their views. And as has been said, over 84% of respondents told the Petitions Committee that the criminalisation of trespass would have a major or a moderate effect on how they live their lives as they do today. Many respondents were concerned that criminalising trespass would increase pre-existing tensions, mistrust and lack of understanding between their local community and, and gypsies and travellers. And there was a large consensus that more needs to be done to provide authorised sites um, for gypsies and travellers. The broad coalition, as I mentioned, from the NSPCC to Liberty, uh, from the Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities to the Ramblers Association, from the police, as has been said uh, many times so far, to, to Shelter, who are united in their view that the proposals put forward by this government would be wrong, would be unhelpful and would in fact go against our own basic rights. The Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill is designed to criminalise the act of trespassing when making an unauthorised encampment. What is proposed in the bill uh, related to trespassing of un un unauthorised encampments is deeply concerning and unnecessary. As one of the responders to the Petitions Committee survey it. The criminalisation of trespass will simply exacerbate an already fraught relationship. Gypsies and travellers will still camp. There'll be more prosecutions, more mistrust, more public money spent on legalities. Other people who have a, a, a nomadic lifestyle have told me that they will no longer, they feel, be able to, to live on the road in the way uh, that uh, we have seen in this country since the, you know, the 16th century and that this bill risks criminalising their very way of life. Failure to comply with a police direction to leave land occupied as part of an unauthorised encampment is already a criminal offence. The proposals create a new offence of residing on land without consent or with a vehicle. The broad way this definition is, is drafted seems to capture the intention uh, to do this as well as actually doing it. So the, the intention uh, can be criminalised as well with penalties of imprisonment of up to three months or a fine of uh, to two and a half thousand pounds or, or both. The loose drafting of, of the wording in this legislation invites problems with its interpretation and it's simply not fair to put this on the police. If someone was to drive in a car, park it and walk on somewhere to, to wild camp beneath the stars, what, uh, what does with a vehicle cover in, in the legislation? How far away from the vehicle would the campus have to be to escape carrying out a potential criminal offence? The major concern uh, that the opposition have with this with this section of, of the bill that, that is articulated in this petition is that it's clearly targeted um, at Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities. And this criminalisation could potentially breach the Human Rights Act of 1998 and the Equality Act of 2010. When the powers in the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994 were first being debated in Parliament, it was stated that the powers were intended to deal with mass trespass. But in this new bill, even a single gypsy or traveller travelling in a single vehicle will be caught by this offence. What constitutes significant damage, disruption or distress is subjective particularly as there only needs to be one vehicle. And what constitutes the intention to cause significant damage, disruption or distress is even more subjective again. That is in part why these measures to increase police powers on unauthorised encampments are not actually act by the police, as we've heard. When friends, families and travellers researched the consultation responses the government received, they found that 84% of the police responses didn't support the criminalisation of unauthorised encampments. The member for South Ribble quoted the Minister for the Police in her opening speech, saying he wants to ensure that the police have the powers they need. Well, they actually believe that they already have powers they need. 
Senior police are telling us that the changes in this bill related to unauthorised encampments would only make matters worse. They would add considerable extra cost to the over, already over, uh, overstressed police and overstretched police and risk potentially breaching the Human Rights Act. Views of the National Chief Police Council and the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners were clearly put in their joint submission to the 2019 government consultation. They wrote, trespass is a criminal offence, is a civil offence, and our view is that it should remain so. The possibility of creating a new criminal offence of intentional trespass has been raised at various times over the years, but the MPCC position has been and remains. No new criminal trespass offence is required. Coordinated use of the powers already available under the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994 allows for a proportionate response to encampments based on the behaviour of the trespasses. We have to ask the question, why is the government determined to lock up gypsies and travellers against even the advice of our own police? The police already have extensive powers to move on unauthorised encampments contained in the Public Order Act. As at January 2020, just 3% of gypsy and traveller caravans in England were on unauthorised encampments. 419 of those caravans were on sites not tolerated and 275 were on tolerated sites. Police and campaigners tell us that the evidence is not there for these new powers to be necessary at all and that much more authorised encampment sites should be provided instead. The Association of Police and Crime Commissioners and the National Police Chiefs Council submitted a joint response to the government's consultation on unauthorised encampments, calling for the shortage of transit sites and the lack of accommodation provision to be addressed. The Home Secretary, in a ministerial statement on the 8th of March 2021, stated, as of January 2020, the number of lawful traveller sites increased by 41% from January 2010. But friends, families and travellers has pointed out that this is a gross misrepresentation of the facts. The 41% referred to by the Home Secretary is in fact an increase in transit position and the ministerial statement fails to include this key component of referencing transit. It actually amounts to about 101 additional transit pitches. That's 10 a year over 10 years, whereas the number of permanent pitches has gone down by over 500 since 2010. This misrepresentation of the figures leads people to believe that there's been a much greater increase in site provision than there actually has. Reality is that government published figures show, as has already been said this afternoon, there's been an overall 8.4% increase of pitches on local authority traveller sites. The government should be focusing on ensuring that local authorities have the resources they need to provide more space for traveller communities to legally reside. By taking an enforcement approach to addressing the number of unauthorised encampments, the government is overlooking the issue of the lack of site provision. There are other solutions to managing unauthorised encampments, such as negotiated stopping, whereby arrangements are made on agreed permitted times on stopping and to ensure the provision of basic amenities such as water, sanitation and refuse collection. The, manif the manifesto commitment uh, from the, uh, the Conservative Party and the government response to the consultation refer to littering as a problem. Why doesn't the government consider providing more authorised camping sites with proper refuse facilities? A family is asked to move on. Where are they supposed to go if there's no authorised encampment in their area? Why does the government think that confiscating someone's home, putting them in prison and fining them is the answer? Legislation that the government's seeking to introduce would cause harm to gypsy and traveller communities for generations and threaten their very way of life. It's impractical and misleading, and it adds nothing useful to the law that already exists to tackle the problems such as rubbish and antisocial behaviour that we all abhor um, that the government claims they're seeking to address. I would urge the government to rethink these harmful proposals. This debate has been a good opportunity to, to, to raise the concerns um, about the forthcoming bill, and we will discuss them in more detail at, at committee stages and as it goes through the House. But I would I would end by asking the minister if he could answer uh, some, some questions in his response. Can the minister provide an update on the progress of the national strategy to tackle gypsy, roma and traveller inequalities, which was announced by the government in June 2019, because we've heard nothing since. Can the minister tell the House, under the provisions in the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, what would happen to a traveller family in a single vehicle who are residing on a highway and have nowhere else to 
go. Is the Minister able to clarify the Home Secretary's claim that there's been a 41% increase in site provision and confirm that this only actually applies to transit provision and that permanent site provision has significantly decreased? Can the Minister confirm that the provisions in the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill on unauthorised encampments are not in breach of the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act? Will the Minister look at different approaches? such as that of the Welsh Labour government, who have a legal duty placed on local authorities to ensure that the accommodation needs of gypsies and travellers are assessed properly and the needs for pitches are met. As an example of the lack of current provision for gypsies and travellers, only eight out of 68 councils in South East England had identified enough land in their area for travellers to live. So can the minister answer, where are those gypsies and traveller families who will otherwise be criminal, criminalised supposed to go? And finally, does the minister agree with the multiple concerns raised by the police and what is he doing about that to ensure that this bill, if passed, doesn't damage our rights as British people and cause more harm than good? Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the minister, Kit Malthouse. Mr Chairman, a great pleasure on this beautiful spring day uh, to appear under your beneficent hat. Um, as I'm sure colleagues are aware, this debate was convened on the strength of an online petition submitted on the 5th of September last year. Uh, since then, the government has published its response to the public consultation, strengthening police powers to tackle unauthorised encampments, and we've introduced the Police, Crime and Sentencing and Courts Bill, which sets out our measures to introduce this new criminal offence. I'm grateful to my honourable uh, friend for her introduction uh, to this particular debate, and indeed to all members who participated. Now, I understand uh, that those who signed the petition were primarily concerned um, about the impact of this new offence uh, that it might have on the ancient freedoms of walkers and the wider public to access the countryside. And as somebody who represents 220 square miles of beautiful uh, chalk downland in the northern part of Hampshire, I am pleased to be able to say that those wishing to enjoy the countryside, including in my constituency, will not be prevented from doing so by this offence. We made that clear in our response to the consultation, and the draft clauses currently before Parliament set out the circumstances in which the new powers can be used. Our proposals, Mr Chairman, which were included in our manifesto, are aimed squarely at unauthorised encampments. For many of our constituents, these cause damage, disruption or distress as well as to landowners and, indeed, significant costs to local authorities. Residents often feel helpless as their local amenities are damaged or disrupted and councils are left in some cases, as with Birmingham back in 2016, with £700,000 of clean-up costs. These bills can be huge, and I've seen this repeatedly in my own constituency as well. It's only right, therefore, that the government seeks to protect citizens and strike a balance uh, for those who are adversely affected by unauthorised encampments. The measures we're introducing in the bill will give the police the powers to bring an end to the misery caused by some unauthorised encampments. The new criminal offence will apply where a person who resides on land with a vehicle causes significant damage, disruption or distress and does not leave when asked to do so. This means they will not apply to people camping in tents in the countryside or others who inadvertently stray on private land. The government is also amending the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994, which gives police the power to direct people away from land in the first instance, where they are causing lower levels of harm, disruption, and distress. We will broaden the types of harm that can be caught under that provision to include physical damage to the land and non-physical damage, such as damage to the environment, which includes excessive noise and litter. Disruption includes a person's ability to access any facilities located on the land or otherwise make lawful use of the land or a supply of water or energy or fuel. Offensive conduct such as threats or abuse are also covered. We will also increase the period in which trespassers directed away from the land must not return from three months to 12 months and enable police to direct people away from land that forms part of a highway. And I'd like to reassure you, Mr Chairman, again, that those wishing to access the countryside to walk, hike or climb, or indeed cycle, as many of us love to do, will not be caught by this measures. We all have the right to enjoy the beautiful national parks and green spaces that this country has to offer, and we will be able to continue to exercise that right even when this bill has been brought in. And I'm sure that this will be a welcome relief to those clubs, associations and individuals 
who've taken time to write their MP for the Home Office on this issue. By all means. I'm very grateful for the Minister giving way. Uh, could, could he explain why he thinks the organisations he indicates, such as the Round of Associations, whose comments I wrote out, are not at all persuaded by the view the government's put forward? And, and while I'm on, on my feet, could he also possibly address the police's concerns here? The policing minister, the police don't believe that these are sensible provisions. And could he also address what the Shadow Minister said in relation to uh, equality in human rights law here? He must be familiar with leading cases of chat with the UK and Bromley in persons unknown. Does he think he's going to face legal challenges if this goes through? Well, Mr Chairman, I'm going to come on to many of those issues later in my speech, if the Honourable Gentleman uh, will be uh, patient. But we did receive significant uh, support uh, in the consultation for some of these measures, not, not least 94% uh, of local authorities who responded to the consultation supported one or more of the proposed amendments to the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, to which he referred in his speech. Uh, to extend the powers of the police to direct trespassers away from land. But as I say, I, I hope, uh, certainly during the passage of the bill, that we will be able to reassure those groups um, who have taken uh, alarm, perhaps, at these measures, that they will not be affected. Remember that there is this lock, that significant harm and destruction must be uh, underway, that they must be residing with a vehicle, which doesn't cover ramblers, presumably they are without a vehicle, and I'm not sure if canoe uh, counts as a vehicle, or indeed that one can reside uh, in a canoe, and so that those who are wild camping or enjoying the countryside will be uh, unaffected. Hopefully that will come as a relief. Now, turning to the impact on traveller communities uh, set out in the petition statement, this is not, Mr Chairman, an anti-traveller law, and it would be wrong to portray it as such. We know that a small minority of people on, on, in unauthorised encampments do cause harm and disruption and distress. But the vast majority of travellers are law-abiding citizens and unauthorised sites can often give an unfair and negative image of their communities. Enforcement will very obviously not be based on ethnicity. Rather, anyone who causes significant harm, disruption or distress in the specified conditions and refuses to leave when asked to do so will be caught by the offence. The government wants to ensure a fair and equal treatment for all travellers, uh, 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 travelling communities, and believes that settled and travelling communities should be able to live side by side, harmoniously, and indeed integrate. And we hope that the clear rules and boundaries that we're putting in place will facilitate that. The police are fully trained, and we expect that their actions will continue to be compliant with equality and human rights law. Now, the government remains committed, um, as the, uh, my shadow uh, spokesman uh, mentioned, uh, to developing a cross-government strategy to tackle the inequalities faced by Gypsy, Roma and travelling travel communities. And we're also committed to supporting the provision of traveller sites via the new homes bonus. This provides an incentive for local authorities to encourage housing growth in their areas and rewards net increases in effective housing stock, including the provision of authorised traveller pitches. In addition, the £11.5 billion pounds affordable homes programme will deliver a wide range of affordable homes to meet the housing needs of people in different circumstances and different housing markets, including funding for new traveller pitches. Data shows that we've also seen the in an increase in the number of caravans on authorised sites from 14,498 in July 2010 to 20,043 in July 2019, showing that this locally-led planning system is working. We do expect that local planning authorities should assess the need for traveller sites in their area and make provision accordingly. And local authorities are best placed to make those decisions about the number and location of such sites locally, having due regard to national policy and local circumstances. Finally, Mr Chairman, I noted that the e-petition refers to the impact of this new offence will have on clamping down on peaceful protest. Of course, the right to protest is a fundamental right, a human right, and essential to our democracy. While this new offence does not apply to protests, we are introducing other measures in the bill which will enable the police to better manage highly disruptive protests, striking a better balance, we believe, between the rights of protesters and the rights of others to go about their business unhindered. No, I, won't. I hope this chamber is reassured that the measures this government is taking are right and balanced and measured, and we're delivering on one of the manifesto commitments we were elected on and I commend the government's response to the petition. Thank you. Captain Fletcher to wind up.
Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, uh, what an interesting debate. Um, uh, you know, we've heard from, um, we've heard from uh, uh, the, you know, passionate enjoyers of the countryside from the cities of Sheffield. Um, I, uh, I particularly enjoyed the description of Manchester and Sheffield being one city with a massive park in the middle of it. And I think that's how much it's valued on both sides. And I think that's come across very clearly uh, with the members from Wirral West, from Hornsey, from Hornsey and Good Green, from, from Worsley and Eccled South, from Sheffield Helen. The idea that access to the environment uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a fundamentally British right, provided we stick within the rules of the countryside. I'd delight to hear that. We've also heard some very powerful testimony um, about the harms that illegal encampments can cause from the member for Ryslip, Northwood and Pinner to give him his full title. Um, you know, it was very obvious that that was obviously a, of a personal pain to him as well as uh, being a serving council officer and significant financial disruption uh, the act of that minority of uh, individuals caused. Um, we've heard from the member from, Hammers uh, from Hammersmith how important he believes to make sure that there's a complete lack of discrimination um, and the extra sites required to provide for a unique part of our heritage that, as a member, forgive me, I've forgotten, mentioned has been part of our life since the 16th century. Um, I will, and, and, uh, and uh, the member for the city of Durham um, making a huge and important plea to make sure that we always bear in mind that racism is, in all forms is abhorrent. Um, I'm quite happy with that. And also, just on a personal note, the idea that so many um, people and uh, members uh, from, uh, from urban constituencies have come in to talk about something that's fundamentally about access to the countryside, you know, uh, uh, you know like the wonderful areas within South Ribble, uh, within the minister's constituency as well. Um, so I will draw to a conclusion there. I will uh, let, hope the petitioners feel that we've done them justice with this debate today and let them draw their own conclusions for what the government and opposition spokesman have Thank you, Mr Chairman. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Thank you. Um, the question is that this House has considered e-petition 300-139 relating to trespass. As many of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting is suspended until 6 p.m. Please, all members, leave the room promptly.